All right, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to the show. Happy Wednesday. I'm your host, Amala Epinobi. <laughs> and we've got Taylor in Nashville. Hey, 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 how's it going, guys? It is going great. I hope you're having a fantastic Wednesday. Drop in the comments down below. Is this your first time catching the show? Let me know. I always love to hear from you guys who are catching this for the first time. We have much to discuss today. Kind of a hodgepodge of stories that are happening right now uh, on the internet. We got Jonathan Van Ness, who is recently on Dax Shepard's Armchair Expert podcast, talking about, you know, a multitude of different things, but they get into a debate back and forth about trans women, of course, being able to compete in women's sports. We're going to get to that. We're also going to talk about the WGA writer's coming to its end and what that means for entertainment. Plus, we've got crazy looting happening in Philly and finally, maybe law enforcement responding. Plus, we're going to have a discussion about pretty privilege and the highs and lows of the concept. First, let's start off with Jonathan Van Ness. You probably have seen this guy before if you are on Netflix quite a bit, if you're using that streaming service. He is one of the, I believe, five gay men who is present in the show Queer Eye, where they essentially meet people who need a physical, mental lifestyle makeover, and they put these five gay men on them and, <laughs> and try to achieve that makeover for them. Uh, I don't know why I use the phrase put the gay men on them, but you all know what I meant by that. <laughs> I think, Taylor, you said you've watched Queer Eye before, right? Uh, yeah, I was on a, a family vacation and uh, somehow it ended up being on the TV uh, while the one of the family children was napping and uh yeah we watched a couple episodes and it made me very uncomfortable but um i had to <laughs> tough my way through it for the peace of the family that's interesting i didn't really mind the show i've seen a few episodes of it i always love a good makeover show uh they of course make you feel good in like a matter of 30 minutes when you watch all these people like go through this transformation and jonathan van ness is one of the more feminine gay men on the show he's actually you know a pretty positive, seemingly nice guy. But he went on Dax Shepard's Armchair Expert podcast. They were talking about his own show, th projects that he's working on. They ended up getting into a debate about trans women being able to compete against biological women in their sports. They go back and forth on this issue. And I'm surprised Dax Shepard pushed Jonathan Van Ness quite a bit on this issue, saying that personally, he didn't agree with biological men and, you know, in his word, trans women competing against women in their sports due to this advantage that they have. Now, I've talked about this at length. We did a recent video about it with Trevor Noah having uh, the trans guest Veronica Ivy on his show to discuss trans women in sports. You can check out my full thoughts on the issue by watching that video. But they go back and forth. And Dax is pushing Jonathan and saying, you know what, I, I don't agree. And Jonathan Van Ness sort of insinuates that if you disagree with him on the issue of trans women in sports, that you could be a transphobe. Now, Dax pushes back and says, you know, I agree with you and I consider myself to be an ally to the trans community. And just because I don't agree with, you know, one out of the 10 things that you're asserting, I'm now a transphobe. Now, Jonathan walks back on on the accusation a bit. And then it comes to this moment in the podcast, which we will listen to now. I just get a lot of little kids who don't get allowed to like join groups. I was really bullied for my gender expression as a little kid. Yeah. And there's a lot of little kids who aren't going to go be Olympic gold medalists. They don't want to go to the Olympics. They're not going to play most, in college. That's most kids. 99% I mean, most... of kids who want to play sports like aren't trying to go to the Olympics. Right. Honestly, I just, I wanted to come like chat about my podcast like other yeah, shows. Yeah, well, like, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. I did not intend at all to get into a debate with you about this. I didn't want that at all. I adore you. I think you're hysterical and talented, and I love that you're an activist. I could just like cry because I'm like so tired of having to like fight for little kids yeah. because they just want to be included. I wish that people were as passionate about little kids being able to like be included or grow up as they were about fictitious women's fairness in sports. Mm. I have to tell you, I am very tired. 
Okay, so there you go. That is the clip. That's where the conversation gets to. Now, I decided to look up this Armchair Expert podcast and actually listen to it, even though I am so goddamn tired of talking about this issue, (laughs) much like Jonathan Van Ness. However, I'm not going to (laughs) cry about how tired I am of debating back and forth about trans women competing in women's sports. I digress. I went and looked up the podcast. I listened to it. It was very choppy. It is very clear that a lot of the conversation that was had during this podcast was cut and edited and clipped and you know, a lot of that, maybe we need a director's cut uh, down the line of, of what actually happened during this conversation. But, you know, in, in my opinion, Jonathan was not, uh, you know, really making great arguments as to why trans women should be able to compete in women's sports was bringing up, you know, the whole intersex debate, which we go back and forth on all the time. And, you know, my thoughts on and Crying, in my opinion, is a really good way to end a debate. (laughs) It's a really good way to get out on top of things and to stop a discussion from moving forward and to stop it from being had. That's just my personal opinion. I think uh, many of you will agree and have probably had that very same tactic used on you. Now, I will give room for the crying being genuine. Maybe Jonathan is genuinely frustrated of his activism on the part of trans women and protecting kids, as he claims, and that just led him to tears. But it is a really good way to stop being pushed on an important issue. (sighs) Taylor, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I like I sympathize most and you 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 could probably attest to this. Like uh a lot of times I think people who have certain strong beliefs on maybe that are more on the progressive side or or whatever do hold them sincerely. And uh I sympathize with that fact, but that's not a justification to like spread lies and and be saying like well the he he suddenly started crying and then immediately was like, and they're, they're doing this to cover this fictitious unfairness. And it's like, it's not fictitious. The science doesn't say it's fictitious. We have documented cases of people like Leah Thomas, just dominating and destroying all these records and documented cases of uh, men identifying as women, taking advantage of these loopholes in prisons to go in and they end up impregnating several of them and all kinds of stuff like that. Like these, these aren't fictitious instances. We spot is not a fictitious uh, instance. And so to, to dismiss something and kind of, it's like a sleight of hand. It's like, look at my tears. But by the way, I'm just dismissing the entire substance of the argument uh, just because I'm getting emotional. And that so it's like I sympathize with the fact that you probably do sincerely care, but also like you can't do that. You can't do that if you're if if we're talking about serious issues and having a real conversation. Yeah. And that's the thing about the crying, right? It cuts off the entire conversation. There are so many other avenues that Dax Dax could have gone in to push uh, Jonathan on this issue and specifically ones that you just brought up, like bathrooms and, you know, uh, spas and prisons. All these things are very real issues for women. And what I appreciate is that Dax Shepard is coming to the defense of women from the perspective of a left-leaning individual. And during this interview, he says, you know, the reason that I'm like pushing back with you on this is because I view women to be one of the most marginalized groups historically. And I think they still need to continue to be uh, respected and they need to continue to be protected. Now, we might not agree on all of the left-leaning aspects of his set of beliefs, but he's choosing from that perspective to be reasonable enough to say that biological men should not be able to compete against biological women. And for those of you who don't know Dak Shepard, I know him best from his role in Parenthood. Uh, He is also married to Kristen Bell. So he's got a a lifetime in Hollywood and in an industry that is not particularly fond of this set of beliefs. So I applaud him for, during his podcast, coming forward and saying, this is how I feel on the issue and speaking to somebody who's on the very left-leaning end of it to go back and forth and usher in a debate. Now, he let it slip at the end when when Jonathan started crying. But I mean, what else are you going to do when the guest on your podcast uh, starts to cry about an issue that you brought up? Uh, I don't know. So (laughs) it's also kind of a telltale sign of like we've seen this uh, a lot of times. We watch one of those Jubilee videos and we notice that some of the like activist types would uh, dismiss the experiences of detransitioners, for example, when they were debating and they'd get very emotional whenever they're worldview that is very, uh, that they hold very strongly and they believe very strongly about these injustices and, and how they need to protect the trans people and all this stuff. Uh, when those get challenged by facts that don't 
that aren't accounted for within their worldview, like, hey, there's pushing people down this path can end up in some permanent harms to their fertility, to their body, to their psyche. Uh, there's lots of uh, ex externalities and unintended consequences of this ideology that you hold so dearly. And rather than being able to process that in good faith and account for all of those and debate them on the merits, it's either this anger, dismissiveness, or in this case, it appears to be sadness and, or, you know, or, or mm -hmm. emotional crying and stuff. And it's whether that's a tactic for him to get out of it in the moment or just a cognitive dissonance moment to where I need this narrative that I believe to be true. Therefore, I, my head explodes whenever you confront me with it. And again, I mean, you can kind of attest to that with uh, how we've talked about your transformation from, from being thinking in those boxes and, and being so emotionally charged. Like I remember your videos, uh, doing the school shooting, uh, speeches and stuff. Um, yeah. and then over time you get that cognitive dissonance and hopefully that's what leads to the, the, the red pill moment. But I don't think that's coming anytime soon for these guys. Yeah. When I was at my most emotional was when I was at my most wrong. And I think you guys will, will, that will hopefully resonate with you as well. When you're immature and you, you get in this hyper state of defensiveness over something that you're wrong about, it does lead to things like, like tears and being super emotional and super dramatic. That's not to say that's exactly what's happening in Jonathan Van Ness's case here. It's just to say that uh, that is a pattern of activity amongst people who are probably not the best at defending their specific set of beliefs. And you have to set aside the crying it's, it's to listen to what is actually being said whilst he's crying. While he's crying, he, as, as Taylor pointed out, he's saying that the woes of women on this issue are completely fictitious. That's what he said. And that his main focus is on protecting children, which means through his viewpoint, allowing children to transition and protecting, you know, uh, you know, medical and social transitioning for children. None of these things are particularly good. But when you cry over them, it sounds like I'm just trying to do the right thing as an activist. Mm -hmm. Crazy. And it's a simplistic, like moralized framing, too, because the way he frames that is unless you agree with my view, then you are somebody who is tormenting and forcing things on these children. And that's that's disingenuous. It leaves no room for nuance. And of course, it sets you up as the correct moral person and anyone who disagrees with you as this evil, horrible person. Yeah. And that's why I love that Dax called him out on that and said, whoa, 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 I agree with you on nine out of 10 things. And now you're saying that what I'm saying is transphobic. And he's like, well, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm just saying that you're you're parroting a lot of the same points that the transphobes do. Call them out on that, guys, because that really is how they are. When I was on the left, it was like, you have to agree with every single thing on the laundry list or you are out of here. And that was everything from like women's repro rights to immigration to trans issues to LGBTQ this, that to everything on race. You had to over the broad spectrum of every single set of beliefs you could possibly have, agree and toe the line of the left for every single thing or you were out, you were done for. And that's not to say the right doesn't do the very same thing because there is a lot of them that do. It's just to say I've never felt more pressure to agree with a certain set of ideals than ideas than I did on that side of, of the issue, which is why at this point, we're political hobos right now because I can't deal with this. <laughs> it's just too much. Now, we're going to move on to some other news here, guys. The WGA writer's strike is now over. It has officially ended. Here is the post. It said it lasted 148 days, the second longest strike in the WGA's history. So the writers are going to be back, guys. Aren't you just so excited about that? <laughs> We're going to get... Do we have like a sarcastic <laughs> golf clap like uh, sound effect or something? You know, like, I oh, wish yeah, so I happy. wish we did. I wish we <laughs> did uh, because that is necessary at this point in time. I'm... I love to say I'm elated and wow, they had a great win during during this strike and we're going to get such good content now as this wave of writers return back to the industry. But I just have a feeling, oh, I have a little feeling that that's not what's going to happen. We're going to get the same garbage we've been getting and now they're just going to get paid more <laughs> to give us <laughs> the same garbage. What's really funny is that <laughs> Drew Barrymore got into all that trouble for, you know, restarting her show again and the picket picket sign people were, were outside her show and it was just two weeks later that the strike ended. So she went through all that strife and now yeah. all the strikers hate her and two weeks later 
the strike came to a close. Now, I did see this article out of Fox, which I don't know if I believe it or not. It says, Disney CEO Bob Iger vows to quiet the noise in culture wars. It says Iger tells Disney investors that culture war battles are bad for business. So it's possible maybe that Bob Iger is going to make a switch here on what they're doing with Disney and the movies that they put out and the content that they create. And maybe, you know, with writers, who knows? And they're going to start shifting away from the, quote, culture war that they have chosen to be quite vocal about in their, their newest films. I don't trust it, though. Well, I need to sit down with Bob Iger and say, you know, what do you view as being a culture war issue? What do you view as, you know, political speak in your movies? And I have a feeling that our views on that are not going to align. We all know that the new Disney Snow White is around the bend now. I believe that's still coming out in 2024. I don't know if the writer's strike has skewed that schedule, if the actor's strike has skewed that schedule. Uh, there was talk of it being pushed and pushed and pushed. So we shall see. But that sounds like it's going to be a woke bit of garbage to me. <laughs> and are they going to suddenly make a shift after that movie? They're flopping in the box office, right? Like they're not making back the money that they're investing in these movies. So something has to change. But are they self-aware enough and, you know, conscious enough to realize exactly what that is? I would yeah, not place bets. Does he have the will also to make the transformation that's necessary and that's what why i'm so skeptical is because he presided over the descent of disney into making either crappy uncreative ideological uh, content that it seems like they're they're they can't help themselves and push as far as they possibly can uh to not alienate the audience but they can't help themselves but cross that line and end up alienating the audience and it seems like also that there's so much institutional capture in within Disney, like we saw those released videos of the executives in that meeting, and they're talking about how we need 50% queer leads, and I have my not so secret gay agenda and all that stuff. Uh, that's the employees and the leadership of that company that are over the creation of the content. So any content that they make that is non woke seems to be very begrudgingly created. It's like they're they're holding themselves back as best they can, but they just they hate making content that would be wholesome because they can't help but want to push their agenda. So unless uh, Bob Iger is willing to clean house and do a top to bottom transformation of that company and really from the ground up, like, no, we're getting back to our roots. Like, I don't trust him to be the guy to bring that in because uh, he's the one who presided over it getting to how bad it was. Yeah. And let's fill you guys in in case you missed this big reimagined tomorrow meeting that Disney had. Here's a clip of some of the things they were talking about in regard to their content. I'm here as a mother of, of two queer children, actually, um, uh, one transgender child um, um, and one pansexual child, um, oh and, and also as a leader. Um, one of our execs stood up and said, you know, we only have a handful of queer leads in our content. And I went, what? I, that can't be true. And I, and I, and I realized, oh, it, it actually is true. And I hope this is a moment where shoot, um, the 50% of the tears, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> are coming. Um, uh, we don't, we just don't allow each other to go backwards. <laughs> we just don't allow each other to go backwards. What would be so funny is that like we get out of this writer's strike, right? The writers return to Disney and Disney's like, whoa, 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 slow down on the culture war. No more like left-leaning propaganda in the movies. And then the writers strike again. <laughs> <laughs> just to bring it back because we can't move backwards guys we must move forward we must progress and progress means adding more queer or trans leads into the movies also i have to know she's got two children who both happen to be lgbtq <sighs> y'all it's, it's us it's us you guys who is that actress that we just had reacted to the video of and she said she had like three kids and each of them <gasps> had some other gender identity across the spectrum there's a short on the channel yeah her. coincidentally her name. her name is Marsha gay harden <laughs> she's, <got, laughs> <Of course. laughs> she's got three kids who are all lgbtq which is just hilarious um Lastly. and you know it's fine you know i don't have anything against against gay people that's totally fine but it's just like if you're a mom and every single one of your kids is like gay 
gay, bi, pan, trans, queer, non-binary. I have a feeling that like you might be injecting some of your personal views into their their minds, especially if you have young children who are saying it. Like Charlize Theron, she has an adopted child uh, who is now dressing like a girl a boy who's now dressing like a girl, like all of her other kids. I'm like, hmm, statistically, is this likely for your kids to all want to do this at the same time at a young age where they shouldn't even understand what any of this means? No, statistically, it's not likely. Crazy. The math is mathing on that, yeah. Uh, real quick, we did a poll for you guys. Are you glad that the writer strike is over? 23% of you say yes, 11% say no, 66% say couldn't care less. Yeah, I'm in that 66% boat, I think. I could not care less either. If anything, I am glad that we won't have to watch people like Brian Cranston, like grandstanding, making these speeches, like he's an oppressed, underpaid oh, actor or something in gosh. Hollywood where he's like, pretending like he's Cesar Chavez in the workers movement or something like that. Like I, that's been a little cringe, which I guess the actors are still striking yes. right now, but hopefully that'll also be over soon. Dude. Yeah. There were so many like fictitious MLK moments that these actors were doing out at the, like the picket lines or whatever, filming themselves, you know, fighting for the struggle of other people. Well, you know that they're hopping like back in their Porsche to drive to their multi-million dollar home to be fanned by their maid or whatever. And then they, you know, scrub some dirt on their face and walk out to the picket lines as if they're actually doing anything. My goodness. It's just the fanfare, guys. It's theater at this point. People, I'm just going to put this out there. I think left-leaning people ache for, like, things to protest, and they love it when there's something that they can, like, take to the streets and, and scream about. It is truly a theatrical moment for them. And you know what? A actors are, you know, the best people to, to do that, I guess. <laughs> So they all get to work. They all get to improv uh, being oppressed and being on the struggle bus. So some some good news maybe for some of you guys. This means that all the late night shows are going to be returning. Uh, so that means you get to watch Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, Stephen Colbert. They're all going to return to your home screen uh, I believe next week on Monday, because all of their writers are back when we just love their comedy. They're just so funny. They're just so fresh. We're going to get more of this, hopefully, from Jimmy Fallon. There was Alpha, then Delta, then Omicron next, but this latest variant might be the best. It's XBB.1.5, another friend of COVID-19 has arrived. Oh my gosh, I just can't wait. Oh my gosh, this is like talent. Uh, you know, whatever writer wrote that, you know, should have a 100% raise, I think. Oh, absolutely. Full <laughs> benefits forever, all the things, yeah. <laughs> And whatever happened to their podcast? Remember at the beginning of the writer strike, the like Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, Seth Meyers, uh, one of whoever else uh, banded together, John Oliver, yeah. and said they were going to make a podcast and like devote the winnings or the earnings of their podcast to their uh, writers while they were on strike. Did anyone ever watch that? Was, was that another tree that fell in the forest that we don't know if it made a noise or not because no one was there to hear it? And I feel like them coming back on the air is a similar situation where uh, no one's going to be there to uh, receive them back on air. So is it even going to make a noise? Anyways. Right. I got to say, I did miss that podcast. I'm sure it was fantastic, uh, but I just did not get to catch an episode. I swear when I see like Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel and all their stuff on YouTube, I'm like, I, I'm putting on my tinfoil hat that YouTube inflates the views that they get online because I just there's just no way in my mind that they're reasonably getting the amount of views that they get on this platform. I don't know if that's true, uh, you know, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> I think Alleged. that they are inflating their views. Now, if we're not getting Jimmy Fallon, you know, singing nice. about new COVID variants, maybe we'll get more moments like this from Jimmy Kimmel. But you know what? I'm still rooting for everybody black because black stories, black performances, and black lives matter. Say it with me, Jimmy. Black, black lives, lives matter. matter. <laughs> Louder, Say it, Jimmy. Jimmy. Black, black lives, lives matter. matter. Louder, Jimmy. Say it so that my kids can hear it. Black, black lives, lives matter. matter. That's right. And because black lives matter, black people will stay at home tonight. Oh, gosh. I can't. It makes me cringe. <laughs> Say it, Jimmy. 
Black Lives Matter. Watching him go through the struggle session right there. Yeah, it's like (laughs) penance for, I think you had the, the, the clip queued up. Uh, earlier before the show, but of the the blackface moment, the notorious Jimmy Kimmel blackface moment, he's yes. never going to live that down. And I think that maybe that played into the struggle session he was just put through. Yeah, I think so. He is never going to live that down. And I will show that clip in just a moment. We did get a $50 super chat. We read those immediately from OT7Army0822. It says, it is so refreshing to see young people being reasonable. Thank you and good luck on your new venture. And this is a first time super chatter. Thank you so much. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. I hope you guys are liking the show uh, now that we're independent. I'm always reading your guys' comments, and you guys are so uh, wonderful and, and positive. So thank you so much for, for supporting the show in its independence. I know I have that clip of, of Jimmy Kimmel doing it. Because Here we go. It's mixed in, so this is even better. Let's, let's watch. Black stories, black performances, and black lives matter. Say it with me, Jimmy. Black, black lives, lives matter. matter. What the hell going on up there? Louder, Jimmy. Black, Black lives, lives matter. matter. UFO live on other planet, phoning home like E.T. Louder, Jimmy, say it so that my pigs can hear it. Black, Black lives, lives matter. matter. Soft brown stomach protects my knees and ankles from unnecessary wear and tear. <laughs> that means shut up in Spanish. See, uh, you just can't run from it. It's the white guilt. It's rearing its ugly head. And you know what? I could not care less about blackface just personally, but you just know he's never going to live down uh, that moment. Neither will the Justin Trudeaus of the world. They are always going to be you know, held accountable for, for that moment in time when they made that choice. And for them, that means bowing down to uh, BLM and any sort of racial movement uh, for the rest of their lives. <laughs> yeah, ironically, that was Jimmy Kimmel was funnier uh, back in those days. I'm not saying that those particular sketches were the funniest things, but like pre woke era, uh, late night wasn't that bad. Like I saw some of y'all mention in Conan in the chat. I used to love Conan O'Brien, uh, Jay Leno back in the day. It's kind of like cheesy, like boomer, but you know, mm-hmm. whatever. It was it had some good good quips and good moments. Uh, and now it seems like they've just they've become. NPCs, right? You turn on any one of them and it's the same type of humor, the same jokes, the same target audience, the same making fun of the right, making fun of, you know, he invoked Mike Pence in that clip. Like it's just the most predictable clapter. There's a small segment of of people who they're catering to who are, you know, going to give them the laughs and clapter and then that's it. And it does, it, it devi- it's divisive, it's alienating. It's not what late night used to be. It's not what major network television used to be. And it's, it's sad that they're all, they've all become the NPCs, but alas, well, everyone's hopefully voting. I guess maybe YouTube's inflating their views, but uh, hopefully people are voting with their eyeballs and not tuning in anymore. Yeah, man. Even when they get like diverse hosts, like uh, we, we spoke about Hassan Minaj being up for taking Trevor Noah's spot in the Daily Show, I believe. They still espouse the same views and are just like making shit up essentially that's literally what what Hassan Minaj is doing for all for the sake of like a left-leaning agenda what's the point of having six different late night show hosts that all say the same thing on any given night like literally they say the same thing they have the same guests they do the same song and dance what is the point there used to be so much variety an actual like variety and personality and what you were getting out of these shows and now it's just stale stale and you know they're all consumed with their their white guilt and the messages about you know get the jab this you know blm that and all to whose benefit i I don't know uh, just the audience who is going to clap along and agree with everything they say no matter what it is now speaking of black lives matter (sighs) they're back baby and in full force uh here is a story out of philly 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 this says More than 50 arrested following a night of looting throughout Philly, Mayor says. Acting Police Commissioner John Stanford said that Tuesday night's looting had nothing to do with the peaceful protest that took place after charges were dismissed against an officer who shot and killed Eddie Irizarry. Now, it says large crowds, mostly consisting of juveniles, looted multiple stores and damaged properties across Philadelphia Tuesday night, police said. It was around 8 p.m. when officials said police started receiving calls that large crowds were making their way into Center City. Among the stores looted were the Foot Locker, the Apple Store near the 15th uh, and Chestnut Street, and the Lululemon Store in the area. And of course... It's because we need to eat, right? We we loot the Lululemons and the Foot Lockers and the Apple Stores because we're starving and because we're impoverished and we have nothing to do with ourselves but to loot and steal. 
Y'all know I don't believe that. Anyways, the acting police commissioner, John Stanford, said, you know, this has nothing to do with the peaceful protests that were also taking place at the same time. Uh, this has everything to do with just criminal opportunists who wanted to take this moment of protest to be criminals. And, you know, I, I can see that point, but I have a feeling that the message of the peaceful protesters of Black Lives Matter, you know, we deserve this, we deserve justice, is going to be very similar to the message you will hear from the looters who were taken to the Foot Locker and the Apple Store and the Lululemon. And if you want to see video of exactly that, and this video is actually shocking, because you'll see police officers actually responding to the looting in this video. What a surprise. <laughs> This is like black pilling me. I swear I can't. I can't deal with this. This videos like this are going to make me racist. I can't deal with it. I can't deal with it. I'm black, and they're gonna make me racist watching these videos because I cannot stand that. Like this is the group of people that is now becoming a representation of the black race who are out doing things like this. And you know, there there's blame to be placed on them for these blatant acts of criminality that they are just doing in tandem with one another. And we're no stranger to that here in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, you have just like gangs of looters who organize their crime, decide we're gonna hit a store and like 60 of them go in and hit the store and grab as much as they can. and. Virtually nothing is done about it, right? The security guards can't do anything. The police don't respond because it's virtually decriminalized. And then all of these people get away with it. And in this case, in the video that you just watched, that's a Lululemon store. And let's go back to some of the news from Lululemon and their CEO when they decided <laughs> to fire two employees. They fired two employees at Lululemon because they tried to intervene in a robbery. The store that they were working at, Two people or, or, you know, multiple people came in and started to steal from the Lululemon store. And these two employees, one tried to stop them and two said, you know, I'm going to call the cops and, you know, try to get them to stop this robbery from happening. Those two employees were fired from Lululemon. And when the CEO was pressed, but, you know, saying, hey, these two employees are trying to protect your property, technically, uh, at this store. He says, oh, we stand by. We stand by the decision to fire those, those two employees. They're taught, you know, not to engage. Now, I can understand it being a liability for the store for, employer, for employees to engage with criminals like this. Totally understand it. But to fire them instead of just going, hey... Maybe for the sake of your safety, this is something that you shouldn't do. You know, we have insurance on, you know, the Lululemon pants that they stole and the shoes or whatever. Just, you know, let it slide, report it to your higher ups at your job, and we don't want your life in danger. That's one thing. But to take two employees who took the initiative to try to protect your property and to fire them and then stand by that firing, I guess you deserve to be looted because you're essentially putting out to the greater world Hey guys, if you want free stuff, come to Lululemon because we're not gonna do anything. And in fact, if our employees try to intervene in your criminality, we're, we're just gonna fire them. <laughs> so the next time that you come and loot our store, those you know pesky kids that you had to deal with won't be working there anymore. <laughs> Dude. Oh. It's just nuts. And th this whole idea that uh, we need to treat criminals, looters, violent criminals with kid gloves, that we need to be soft on crime, that we need to not confront or call out this behavior uh, because what, like, what's the rationale for that? I don't get it. Because if you sincerely care about protesting injustice or standing on the side of those who are sincerely protesting injustice, then the bad actors who are mixing themselves in with the under the pretense of protesting racial injustice, 
should be the ones that you're calling out and you should be the loudest if you're promoting that message to say no that this is this behavior has nothing to do with what we are what we stand for and what we're promoting but instead you get policies like this from virtue signaling companies like lululemon and you get people like patrice colors who's at the head of the black lives matter movement who is basically money laundering the donations of people who are supposedly supporting this cause and buying yeah. ourselves a bunch of mansions so this whole movement lacks credibility because they're unwilling to say what needs to be said and do what you just did, which is say, no, I'm not going to lower the bar. This is not endemic behavior to my race or my half race in your, in your case. This is not uh, what is expected of us. We, th this doesn't, isn't representative. I'd not, I, I don't want to be part of a movement that it says that this is okay, that we should lower the bar, that this is just uh, what should be expected or, or whatever. Like we just should not treat this with kid gloves. We should have clarity in what we stand for and what we stand against and right is right and wrong is wrong. And if these policies sh should not be soft on the crime or the looting or anything, uh, we can't begin to make progress until we're willing to in draw those lines and bring clarity to the situation and, and be truthful. And yeah. uh, that's why it's just difficult to give any credibility to this stuff until until they're willing to do that. Dude, yeah, nip it in the bud. Like literally cash these people, all 50 people that you got that you caught during this looting spree or whatever. Ten years. Bye. Literally, just 10 years. And then mm -hmm. see how quickly, see how quickly the message spreads that if you go and steal an iPhone from the Apple store or you go and you try to grab some shoes from Lululemon or that, you know, you organize 10 other people to do the same with you. 10 years. Bye. <laughs> I mean, like, you're not a force for good in society. And if they did that, do you know how quickly all of this would dissipate? Here's another video uh, just to show how extensive this crime spree was on Tuesday night in Philly. This is an Apple store. Go! Just like look at the age of these kids too. I mean, they look like 13, 15, 16. Security running. Oh, shit, what's up? Yeah, Max! Yo, Max, I'm... Dude, just look at that. It's just nuts. It's nuts. This got so bad. And they went around, you know, looting liquor stores and all that. I believe they looted, I think, 18 liquor stores. You guys can fact check me on that. That, you know, today, almost all the liquor stores are closed because of how badly they were looted. That's what they're dealing with right now. So you have uh, presumably small business owners who are trying to get by. And guess what? In Philly, you'd have to guess that a lot of those business owners are also black people. So you have black people trying to get by in their city, trying to, you know, make ends meet in an economy that's in inflated. We're all like struggling with things. Gas prices are through the roof and the audacity of people from your own community to come in, to break your property, to steal your property and to leave you in a mess where you can't even open your store the next day to make the money back. That's insane. And if you have a state government or, you know, the city governance that is allowing these things to happen, they should have to pay each and every one of those business owners for every single piece of property that they lost. They should have to pay them because they are, in fact, the ones who are bringing about this sort of behavior, who are decriminalizing it and who are allowing people at the age of like 13, 14, 15 to become career criminals. Now, I have one more video here. This is a girl who is apparently responsible for organizing a, a bit of this. Uh, and here is her video of them looting a liquor store. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Everybody must eat. Everybody must eat. Everybody must eat. Everybody. Everybody must eat. Yes. Everybody must eat. Everybody must eat. Everybody must eat. Yeah. Everybody must eat. Everybody must eat. That's why we're stealing bottles of Hennessy and Tito's vodka. Everybody must eat. Oh, goodness gracious. Luckily, her story is a two-part story because here's her mugshot. <laughs> and, you know, here are some tears rolling down the face of somebody who wasn't being, you know, wasn't expecting to be held accountable for her actions. And that's what's happening here. When you have people gather in mass like this and go into a store, it's because they are by no means expecting anybody to do anything about their behavior. And why is that? Because we've essentially told them you can do whatever you, you, you can do whatever you want. 
your oppression score is so high that you can do whatever you want and we're not going to do anything about it. So just go and loot the liquor store and the Lululemon and the Foot Locker and all these things, which is like, oh my gosh, could y'all be like, could you be more stereotypical? You're, you're really going to go loot the Apple store and Foot Locker and the liquor store? That's what you're choosing to do? Could you paint a worse picture of your own community? Probably not. Probably incapable. But they get arrested, luckily. Uh, and this doesn't happen often, and in, in nowhere near as often as it should, where these people are actually held accountable. And yes, those tears are, you know, the, the realization that accountability was around the corner. And again, I hope 10, 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. I'm going to become a freaking dictator. These 10 years. Bye bye. Everybody must eat that prison food. <laughs> yeah, everybody must eat that. You know, in prison, you'll be eating, you know, multiple times a day. That neutral loaf is going to be delicious. <laughs> um, anyways, oh, dear. gosh, I'm just, I can't. And, you know, in the wake of some of this, here's some some separate news. It says breaking Target is going to close nine stores in major cities across the U.S. due to violence and theft. This includes one of the targets in New York City's locations, three stores in San Francisco. Target said in a statement that the safety of their team and guests are at risk, forcing closures. This comes after Target said that theft is costing them more than $500 million this year. Walmart has also been contemplating shutting stores and raising prices due to theft. Now, these are not the only stores. So you got Target, you got Walmart, I believe CVS and Walgreens did something very similar. Starbucks pulled out of, I believe, five different major blue run cities, coincidentally enough. And not because, oh, we don't want to be here anymore. We have business opportunities elsewhere because we cannot physically be here without the lives of our workers being threatened. Starbucks specifically was like, yo, our baristas are getting assaulted. So the people who are, you know, slinging coffee cups are having their lives threatened because we are located in the cities that we're located in. So now we got to dip and now we got to go. $500 million a year lost is crazy. It's crazy. And when you go to stores in Los Angeles and for all of you like living in the Midwest or in places where these problems are not happening, let me just describe what it's like to go to Target. You go to Target and you're like, you know what? I just want maybe a nail polish, a deodorant. A razor, maybe, so that I can go home, you know, have a little me day, do a little self-care. You go there and it's like, excuse me, I need an employee to unlock a $2 bottle of blue nail polish for me. Can I get that? God forbid you want some false eyelashes. Excuse me. <laughs> can I go track around the store to find some 18-year-old employee so that they can unlock this for me and give me permission to pull some false eyelashes out of, out of the case here? And it's like that for every single item. It's just crazy. <laughs> and it seems like when the targets uh, and companies like that are pulling out of these cities, you know, they have some weight to throw around. This is a, one of the biggest retail chain stores in America. And you could be very vocal about the policies that are leading you to have to close your stores for the safety of your employees or because it's just unprofitable and untenable to have uh, locations in some of these cities because of the policies that are in place in these cities that are making it uh, just out of control situation and crime being out of control. But instead, it seems like they kind of leave with their tail between their legs and just kind of like, well, I guess we can't do anything about this because, Jen, by and large, these companies share the progressive politics of the cities that are making it so that those companies cannot sustain themselves in those cities. So it's just kind of ironic to me that they're unwilling to be more outspoken uh, in in to combat the policies that are leading to their unprofitability. It's even when it's not in their own self-interest, it's similar to how we talked about Disney's unwilling to just make wholesome, uh, unwoke content by and large. Uh, they'd rather be unprofitable and continue putting out things that flop just because they can't help themselves, but to continue to stand by uh, their, their progressive agenda. Yeah, because if you really have the conversation, here's the kicker, guys. If you really come forward and admit what's happening, you have to admit who the perpetrators are. 
And that's the most difficult part of the conversation, right? Because Target specifically, you see this Target right here that's closing all of its stores and locations in these big cities was a massive supporter of Black Lives Matter. So many of the Target stores in the wake of George Floyd, when everybody was taken to the streets and looting, mind you. So this is when the, the stealing and looting and the smash and grabs really came to a head. Target was painting murals of like George Floyd and, you know, we stand for Black Lives Matter and all this different stuff. Act Actively while their store was getting looted, putting up murals for this stuff. So how is it now that you're going to walk back on this massive stance that you took in the name of Black Lives Matter when you're going to find that there's a lot of black lives looting your store? And then I see this leftist girl, she hops on the internet, she makes a video and she goes, you know, I go into Walmart and I think Walmart's racist. When I go into the makeup section at Walmart, why is it that all of the black foundation colors are behind, you know, locks? Why, why is it that all the white ones are open? Why is it that I can get sunscreen, but I can't go get any black makeup products? It's like, baby girl, if you were using your brain, using that noodle you got up there, maybe Walmart is aware that the black foundations and the brown shades and the black makeup is what is being stolen when they do their inventory. So if they're going to lock up certain products, it's going to be the products that are getting stolen. And this is not an indictment on all black people. I want to make that very clear because I'm, I'm obviously making jokes about this, whatever. It's an indictment on the black people who choose to engage in criminal behavior because it ruins life for the rest of us. Now, you kind of feel like you're part of it, like you're roped into it. Now I have to go to the store and if I want a brown foundation, I have to ask somebody to open up, open up a little place for it. We're essentially segregating ourselves because now like white products or things that white people use is gonna be free for all, open, they can just go and grab it. And then we have to raise our hand and go, oh, excuse me, sir, can you open up this case for me so that I can get my foundation? And we're, we're apparently anti-segregation as we are actively segregating ourselves in society with this behavior. It's just crazy. It ruins it for the lot of people who, you know, are choosing to be in the world in a legal way, who are choosing to follow the laws and legislation of the land. And to have kids, like literal 13, 15, 16 year olds, ruining it for everybody else is devastating in that that is the effect that it has on the black community, but also that these are children who are being socialized into this sort of behavior. You should be scared. If you are getting, if you're in Philly right now and you're getting this sort of behavior from 13 year olds. <laughs> Imagine when they're 20. Imagine when they're 25. Imagine when they're grown men and they care even less about their impact on the world. Y'all, you need to nip it in the bud and quick, quick. I don't know what else I can say about this story. <laughs> That's all I got. Yeah, I mean, when you said that they're being socialized into this, like a lot of times, we, of course, we always talk about like black communities and families and stuff like that. But I would say for like the woke white people who push the narrative that you're you're a victim you're oppressed there be there's racial injustice the the country is systemically racist and it's against you therefore we're going to treat you with kid gloves therefore you can go and do whatever you want to do with impunity and not have to suffer the consequences like any normal person would of your actions it leads to patterns that we see in like you're describing in in walmart where the certain uh skin tones are being stolen and others aren't because this, they're being taught and told by the culture constantly that uh you don't need to suffer the consequences of your actions you deserve to violate the law you deserve to go and take whatever you want because oh that you you've been stolen from you've been oppressed and all that and we don't have to get into the 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 details of that debate right now but the the victim narrative certainly has unintended consequences in that light and it it entrenches this mindset mm -hmm. that we're we're seeing the consequences of play out in real time yeah and it's going to continue man the more that we foster it we're fostering it in schools and then there's no backing of like a parent or a nuclear family to like adjust and to give a, a better narrative or to at least show a uh, role models to to young children it's happening for all races i want to make that abundantly clear uh that is just what's going to happen you're going to see like criminality through the roof and then you have these cities that go oh let's just decriminalize that we don't want x amount of people in prison or in jail so in order to lower the numbers let's not you know really crack down on crime and be proactive about it and get people to stop committing crimes let's just let them do it 
uh, and let everybody else just be affected by it and let the community, you know, just reap all of the repercussions of this choice and uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, and this is how they're figuring it out. So 50 looters just arrested in, in Philly. And y'all know, y'all watch the videos, there's way more than 50 of them. So probably didn't even get half. But hopefully that they decide that this is a time to crack down. If you can loot that many stores in one night, it's going to happen every night uh, for the rest of our, our lives. If you're, if you're capable of achieving just that much with that little group of people, just you wait for what happens next. Now we're gonna have one more discussion here. This young woman went viral uh, for talking about pretty privilege. This video got 23.7 million views and she's essentially saying that because she's pretty, she gets catcalled more and that, you know, it's harder for her to pump gas alone as a pretty woman. So let's get into a discussion. Let's watch her video first. It says, POV, you're a girl pumping gas alone, immediately analyzing everything. Anxious tapping, notices a truck going slow and staring. Okay, me, what the F are you staring at? Quickly leaves even when it's not filled yet. So this sparked a lot of controversy, right? Okay, so some people were saying, I totally agree. You know, the prettier you are, the more that you have to deal with this. People don't understand that with pretty privilege comes this inherent anxiety about your surroundings and how people are gonna treat you. Others were like, girl, what are you wearing? You're uh, literally pumping your gas in underwear. There's no, you know, there's a, a pretty much an explanation as to why people are staring at you. And others said, you know, girls who are ugly to average to beautiful are getting hit on and catcalled and harassed every single day. Baby, you are not special and it has nothing to do with pretty privilege. And when you make it about your pretty privilege, you are silencing essentially, the victims, you know, the the more average looking women, the less attractive looking women who deal with the same harassment, catcalling and patriarchy that you deal with on any given day. I stand in the middle on this issue and I'm curious to see how you feel. I don't know how we could ask this in a poll to the audience, but I, I think everybody deals with with some form of just like cat calling or guy staring or whatever, it doesn't really matter what you look like. Guys will just go for just about anything and especially not uh, respectful men. They will engage in this behavior with virtually any woman that crosses them. So, but I can also say that if you are a beneficiary of pretty privilege, meaning that you are a little bit more attractive than the average human being, you're gonna get more attention. Uh, and that that is going to happen to you. I also think people are quicker, uh, they'll quicker jump to the defense of a of a prettier person, whereas the, the less attractive person, they might get harassed or whatever, and other people will just let it slide. If a pretty girl is getting harassed, you know, I think somebody would step in and be like, yo, even just to be the savior who gets the pretty girl, they'll say, hey, don't bother, don't bother the miss, you know what I mean? <laughs> just let her, let her go about her business. So I think there's layers to this. This video is just a little funny because she's in broad daylight at a gas station. Like you're, you're by and large, you're gonna be fine. You're also wearing very little clothing. So that's something to note. You know, if you're so worried about being harassed by men, maybe don't dress in a bra and biker shorts pulled up your butt. Just a note. <laughs> like, like you said, Alma, there, like, when you say there's layers to this, at the risk of invalidating the experiences of women and pretty women, um, I could say, even for me, especially not so much now that I'm in Nashville, but when I was in LA in particular, it's scary going to a gas station even as a man because you don't know what kind of crazy folks are going to approach you and try to hit you up for money or worse. Uh, at any given time. So I think there's an element of this. One of the layers is this is just something that people deal with in general when filling yeah. up gas or in certain situations when you're out in public, where you're likely, especially in certain cities, to be approached by people who are going to ask something of you or put pressure on you or worse. And so there's an element of this where it's like, that's just life. And I added that in the poll. I I, I made a poll that said, uh, what's to blame for this What's mainly to blame for her unease while filling up gas? Is it being pretty, being a woman, or that's just life? 69% of you are saying that's just life. 25% say it's being a woman, and 5% say it's being pretty. So I'm not saying that there's not a, an extra layer of it. Obviously, you're more vulnerable as a woman. There's, a there's you know, the 
bad men out there who are only looking to exploit women or, or you know, whatever. Uh, and then being pretty, I'm sure, adds a little bit of that. But it's probably somewhat proportional to <laughs> the results of our poll, where the prettiness only adds like a 5% margin on top of what all women are and all people are experiencing. Yeah, I think a lot a lot of women, I'm going to say this, this might be a real hot take because I know that like you can dress in baggy clothes and whatever and still get hit on. It happens all the time, right? But there is an element of reducing your risk factor. And a lot of women will not admit that. They'll say, oh, you know, I could go out in anything and still be hit on by a horrible man. And yeah, that's true. But is there an element of being able to reduce your risk, right? Like if I go out tonight and I put on, you know, sweatpants, a large hoodie and a hat and I, and I go out about my business, I'm going to have far less individuals interacting with me than if I go out wearing lingerie. Can we just admit that that's a fact? But then women go, oh no, it happens to us no matter what we look like or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, I get that. But you can reduce your risk. That does not mean you need to hike your booty shorts up your butt and go outside and just like see what happens because it happens in whatever I wear anyways. B F F R. <laughs> Stop playing with me and there is an element and i'm gonna say this too it might ruffle some feathers women do like to hold on to their oppression points when it comes to this like it, it should be noted and i think somebody commented this on youtube mr diggs shout out to you that this young woman in this video decided to set up a camera and film herself while she was getting gas if you were really that worried and that anxious about somebody harassing you or like coming up to you and you know having an altercation at the gas station why are you setting up your phone and filming yourself while wearing a sports bra and biker shorts. Get back to me on that because I don't know why you would do that if you were truly that scared. And, you know, there are ways to protect yourselves in, in this situation like this. And I'll be the first to admit, if it's nighttime, right, I'm going to think twice about going over to a gas station by myself, 100%, as I think any woman slash person should. There are not many great things that happen like past 11 p.m. There's not, there's not really much to be doing. I get it. If you want to go dancing, which I like to do a lot, you want to go out and have a good time, which I like to do a lot as well. That's totally fine. I get it. And you know, sometimes that takes being out past 11 PM, but there are not many great things that happen out in the street or out in the gas station past 11 PM. So what are you doing there in the first place? And just use a little bit of common sense. I get it. Like the world is hard. Nobody should get harassed. Nobody should get cat called. And if I could wave a mask magic wand and stop it from happening, I would do exactly that, right? I would stop all women from being harassed, all men from being attacked. However, I live in reality. So like, what are the precautions that I can take as a human being to hopefully not find myself in a situation like that, or at least reduce the risk of being in a situation like that? And in this case, it is dressing modestly. It's checking the time before you get gas, you know, being proactive about having a car that's filled out before it's it's 2 a.m. and you're driving around in, in the city. It's scoping out, you know, well-lit places that not a lot of like sketchy stuff is happening at. All of these different things you can do to mitigate your risk. And that doesn't mean it stops bad things from happening because unfortunately bad things happen to really good, really prepared people. But the more prepared you are, the better. And that's all I got to say. Here, here. You guys are hilarious in the chat, by the way. What are they no saying? Fun, no fun hopes like... Star pumping gas with my shirt off and rubbing baby oil on my ass. Oh, I'm so sick of the attention. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, no, we have a video coming out that's going to be more in depth about this discussion because y'all know how I feel about like gym girls who do this where they literally are wearing spandex all the way up their butt all the way up their butt and they go to the gym, they film themselves and then they complain about men, you know, leering at them and talking to them and all this stuff. So we have a whole video about that coming out tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, spoil everything that's said in that. But there is much more to discuss on this. And yes, pretty privilege uh, can affect the way that people interact with you and just how often people interact with you. I don't think anybody's going to deny that. But it is kind of a shared reality that we all have now, guys. We're going to get into Super Chats. It's about that time. Let's do it. Let's hear from you guys. Let's hear from you. 
enough of enough of us yapping. <laughs> uh, all right, Diva Dawn first. She's a regular. Says uh, Amla and Taylor. It always makes me happy to see you guys live. Hope you're having oh. a fabulous week. Thank Is you. Is your week fabulous so far, Amla? It has been just fantastic. My my boyfriend's family has been visiting, so we've been showing them all around LA. So I've just been like working in the day, hanging out around LA in the afternoon. So it's been. It's been fun, and I've met so many of you guys. Everywhere I go now, I meet somebody who has watched the show or is a fan of the show, and that's so cool. I love meeting you guys, so if you do ever see me, feel free to come and say hi. That's awesome. Um, Mason Pyle says, what were your thoughts on Zelensky and Trudeau clapping for a Ukrainian SS officer? You know, I don't, I didn't have like enough information about this guy's background. It's definitely a hundred percent a very bad look. And I find it hard to believe that they didn't, you know, know all of this information before cheering on a Nazi. I think, uh, there, there's nuance to be injected into the conversation there, but when it comes to Nazis, I don't know how, <laughs> how exactly nuanced I want to be. For me, it's a red flag, no go, don't do it, and a super bad look, especially with all the other conversations that are being drummed up about Ukraine and Zelensky and our involvement and all of these things uh, and all the money that we've sent them. Just bad, bad, bad. Horrible. Bad, bad, to put it nicely. Just bad, bad, bad. Uh, Let's see. Diva Dawn again says, I do not believe that those tears are real at all. Uh, Talking about Jonathan Van Ness. He's using them as a diversion. It's emotional manipulation. And that's what these activists do. Yeah, it's hard to tell because like when I was I was just listening to the podcast, I couldn't see what was happening. I feel like if I could see what was happening, I'd have a better judgment as to whether or not I felt like it was manipulation. But, you know, it could be either way. Uh, But just always look out for manipulation in, in instances like that. It's hard to, you know, give a hard and fast judgment as to whether or not that's what this was. But it is eerily familiar to who I was like five years ago. So, yeah, or just like you say, Amala, like if you if I if you are in a disagreement with someone and you're like, well, is there anything that I could tell you or evidence that I could supply that could change your mind? And if, mm-hmm. if they answer no, then okay, you're no, you're done. Similarly, if you're engaged in a disagreement with someone and they're not acting in good faith and demonstrating that by resorting to emotions, getting angry, getting crying or whatever, and trying to manipulate the situation to get out of having an honest discussion about the issue at hand, then you just know, okay, this is not somebody who I can have a real conversation with. And so just take that knowledge and do what you will with it. Right. Uh, Rochelle Foreman says nothing but sends a little sticker that says, how's it going? Oh, thanks. (laughs) And it's going great. (laughs) Going great. YouTube is censoring my comments. Says, wait, talking about Snow White, Disney fired Rachel Ziegler, and every right winger's praised the firing and praised cancel culture. You must have missed it. Wait, what? I saw the tweet about this. I think she made. It, there was a deceptive headline that said she got fired from movie, like Snow White actress got fired from movie, but uh, it wasn't Snow White that they're referring to. It was maybe this new Paddington movie that she's supposed to be in, which I don't even know if that's confirmed that she's not going to be in the Paddington now, I'm literally but she's definitely, reading. they haven't canceled Snow White from anything that I saw this morning uh, doing a search on the internet. So. Okay. Yeah. It says here, um, so far Disney has neither confirmed nor denied the claim, but inside the magic stated that a certain TikTok video was the source behind the alleged firing. It further added that quote, there is no source stated for this information in the video. So it is still a reported statement and not fully confirmed confirmed hmm so there you go i find that i don't think that would be a good look for disney i don't think that would be a smart move you you if i was disney i would either recreate the film or like you know take all the footage that you have and try to chop up something that makes more sense but firing the hispanic actress that you chose to play snow white amid controversy over you know whether or not the movie's feminist or anti-feminist or whatever would probably not work out in their favor from any angle didn't they have a big like move big budget DC movie that they like completely filmed and everything and then they like didn't release it or decided to ax it after it was like already created? You guys help me out in the chat if you know what I'm talking about. But um you know the the fact that they're willing to do that would but I think that was more of like a creative decision. Like they had a new head of the studio who wanted to take a different direction. It wasn't about like, Oh, one of the actors is making a bunch of bad press for us. We better renege this. And, and the person 
uh, who's leading that, who's leading the DC movies, I'm sure wasn't a minority who they would get a lot of backlash yeah, for. So right. I think it would take a lot for Disney to to back out of this movie. I, I was think saying so it's Justice too. League, Batgirl. Okay, so there were maybe more than one. So ah, Batgirl. Anyway. Okay, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, but we'll 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 stay on the Rachel Zegler news, guys. Don't we worry, will. we know you you love hearing about all the updates on that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Casey Bennett says I was adopted, and my real mom has five other kids. All of them are in California. All of them are non-binary or part of the alphabet soup. Whoa. One of them is a heroin addict. I am so glad she didn't raise me. Whoa, that's a crazy story. Oh my gosh, I guess it's like kind of dodged a bullet situation and you seem to think that too wow i'd say so yeah i'd I'd probably say so that's crazy uh let's see cassandra 444 says keep it up thank you cassandra uh shame in the hedgehog says love the show thank you for all that you do who's your favorite presidential candidate oh i don't have one guys i literally it irks me to watch anything i even got invited to go and watch the rnc debate uh that is i think tomorrow night is that or is it tonight what is what is today it's actually tonight i think at the reagan library the reagan foundation or something like that and i was like yeah nope (laughs) <laughs> i'm not gonna i'm sorry i'm not gonna watch that i i can't even bring myself to watch it on my phone when it's happening because it's just theatrical bs pandering horrible disgusting uh so i don't have a favorite presidential candidate for you guys i apologize even now i'm not at prager you anymore i can endorse whoever i want none of them <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it's tough uh okay emily teedman says i'm so tired of having to fight for little kids what about i'm so tired of seeing young women getting screwed out of scholarships and awards right oh but that's fictitious to jonathan van ness that has never happened in fact it is all fictional it is a boogeyman created by the right just nuts Uh, Diva Dawn again says, uh, these people are basically glorifying insanity because she looks absolutely insane behaving like that. And she's proud of the behavior. Which one? The looters? Yeah, I would have to guess that that's the looters. Well, that is, in fact, that is exactly, whichever situation you're talking about, that is exactly what's happening. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't even really matter. I do. I do (laughs) concur, doctor. (laughs) Uh, let's see. Uh, Hoosier Heyday says Philly is a mess. Pull up Kensington live cam as we speak and prepare yourself for heartbreak. What? This is what we have to look forward to. I'm scared. Truly sad. Kensington live cam. I'm not going to pull it up on the stream itself, but I am yeah, is going that to. One of the like rough streets Kensington or, Avenue? or something, I think. Okay, hold on. Let me turn. Can I turn the volume off? Oh, it's a members only content. Sorry. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Anyways, we can keep going through. I'm going to look for this. Take your word for it on yeah. that one. It just looks like uh, a bunch of people taking to the street. <laughs> Rushi, Rushi says, hey, I wanted to draw you and was wondering if you had a pic from your new photo shoot that you would want me to draw. My Insta is Rushi Art. Uh, hi, Taylor. Oh, man. You can post any, anything that's on my Instagram. I would love to see some of your guys' art. I think that's awesome. Just shoot whichever one's your favorite. There you go. Permission granted. <laughs> uh and for those of y'all, it's R-U-U-S-H-I-I if you wanted to check out her Rushy art page nice. on Insta. Uh, Oatmeal says, that's why you go to the gym at night so no women are recording laughing emoji. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, uh, do they not? Yeah, I guess no. there's not really going to be any women there who are doing that at night. I would hope. Gosh, that's just another thing to to worry about as a woman. But... Yeah, I, I hear that there's the treacherous influencers are all over the L.A. gyms here with their, you know, tripods and stuff, which I get it. You know, get your bag. Right. And if your bag is in fitness influencing, I think if there's any sort of influencer that the world would need more than the others, it's probably ones who are doing health and fitness. So, you know, at least you're influencing people to go to the gym. But I can understand as a gym goer how that would be so annoying, which I think some gyms have like no filming policies other ones are specific to influencers and i think that's the direction that things need to move in they should just i, th- I know la has them but they should just do like influencer gyms that are like made nice and pretty so they can film whatever they want and do it quarantine y'all in the gyms i'm putting you in that category i'm just kidding <laughs> influencers uh, i have yet to see. film a workout uh it wouldn't be i wouldn't be influencing you to work out my workouts are not fun <laughs> so <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm not having fun when I do them. So. Still waiting for the ice bath video. Dude, okay, so I just realized my apartment, I thought this whole time had no hose system. So when I was filling my ice bath, I was literally taking pots of water from my kitchen, filling up the pot of water, going downstairs, putting it in the ice bath, and then grabbing ice from 7-Eleven. But guys, I just made the realization yesterday that my apartment indeed has a hose. It was just on the other side of the building. So ice baths are coming back, baby. <laughs> All right. Just in time for winter. They are. Uh, or fall, I guess. Um, Miss Q Mac says, or Mrs. Q Mac says, finally caught you live. I love your takes and the courtesy with which you deliver them. But logical thought goes a long way. Thank you. Was I courteous in today's stream? I feel like I was a little heated on uh, some of yeah. these stories. They deserved it. <laughs> Your heated is still courteous relative to most of what's out there, I think. Uh, Alice uh, Iris says, I saw the 1975 last weekend and had a great 2014 indie sleaze time. What are you being for Halloween? Me okay. and my boyfriend are doing Fleabag and the Priest hug hug. That is so adorable. And that is so I don't cute. Know what that is. You've never seen the show Fleabag? You probably uh, would not like it. It is not... It's not. It's definitely not made for a Christian audience. I will say. Okay. Cool. I will say that much. Uh, but it is a good show. If you and if Phoebe Waller Bridge wrote the show Fleabag. By the way, I'm going to see the 1975, and I'm seeing them next week, and I'm so excited. They're my favorite band. And I was just with my boyfriend's family, and we went out to dinner, and I was just you know talking about how the 1975 is my favorite band. And then we were like, from dinner, we're gonna go play pool. So we go to this bar that we play pool at, and who was there? Ross, the bass player from the 1975. I literally walk into the bar after just talking about them, and he like walks past me, and I was like. What the heck? So I guess they just had a California hit on their tour. So they're in L.A. early. And the bass player of the band was just right there in the bar that I go to. What are the odds, good, people? Good thing you know what he looks like because he would have just been a Joe Schmo to me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Get out of the way, guy. I'm trying to play yeah. Cool. That is so weird. Like, what are the <laughs> odds that that would be happening? And I just happen to walk into the same place as my my favorite band. Nobody else was there, guys. For all of you who listened to 1975, you know, like Adam and George and Maddie, they were not there. Ross was there on his own. Thanks for that update. <laughs> <laughs> Follow my 1975 fan page for more updates. Yeah, exactly. I just have like a Finsta that's 1975 memes. <laughs> uh gabriella ortiz says do you ever worry about negative press and getting canceled i love your show guys it keeps me going no i feel like uh how could they cancel me at this point like I, we can get demonetized sometimes i'm like okay if we get demonetized we'll be on the struggle bus for a little bit but we're not on a limb talking about uh, trans issues again today dude if, any, if there's so anything hard to avoid youtube comes down hard on trans issues and we do not shy away from that at all we're just coming out you know and just saying what we think about that so that is the only thing that I, I wouldn't even say worry about, but I view as a potential possibility in the, the content that we create. But other than that, I mean, like, you guys support the message. I feel like we're some of the more, like, tame people who are having these conversations and we're actually trying to give voice to the left-leaning side uh, of these issues. And I think that will be fine. You're, you'll be fine Shh. if you're telling the truth. This is true. Um I was going to say a shameless plug, since Amala hates to do it. If you do want to help us mitigate against the crackdown or to risk an ever-present threat of crackdown by YouTube on our speech and on the truth that we try to share, we did start a Patreon, so that link is in the description down below. All the tiers get the same benefits, uh, but it's just there if you want to help us out voluntarily. But as Amala always says, no pressure. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Mr. Diggs says from the cheap sets, uh, too many subjects with lots of content who needs writers, movies and Netflix. Maybe real life is here. Tree huggers are dangerous too. Whoa. What that was a lot of sentences? Yeah. I got a lot uh, of different vibes from that yeah. <laughs> message. I'm not sure which one to follow. Um, uh, cheap sets. I do agree with you on like who needs writers this time. It's kind of like, it's kind of crazy that like all these, what we're coming to find not even we already knew this, but all of these late night shows and like people who present themselves as like sharing their opinion have like a huge team of like 20 to 50 writers behind them who are just telling them what to say at any given moment, which really dilutes actual talent. Like, I don't think 
that like the Johnny Carsons of the world had such huge teams of like writers writing everything that they say. Those men were really good at like ad libbing and improving and had like a character that they brought to the stage. And now it's just talent. like, yeah, actual talent. But it seems though in, in every industry now, actual talent is like watered down by teams of writers who are just telling you what to say or in the case of music you have ghost writers and producers who are just putting your music together and then just they're slapping a face and a voice on it and that that sucks like true talent is really being diluted by like nepo babies and writers <laughs> nepo babies diversity hires and nepo babies an agenda and i'm not anti-nepo baby you know what if your parents are successful and they got connections i would i would use them too if if mine we're, we're like that. So, you know, no hate to the Nepo babies. I'm just saying there are more uh, truly talented people out there. We did get a $50 super chat from Frank Lindsay. It doesn't have a message, but just some balloons with the number one. Thank you so much, Frank, for your support. We greatly appreciate it. And a couple last minute ones from Jennifer. No message. Alex Slusher, no message. And Jaylee Morales says, First time catching a live. Keep up the good work. So oh. thank you guys. And I think we're oh, uh, one more in Taylor. There. Ooh. One more in real in time. Eunice Unsilent Hills says it's daily here in Philly. Officers avoid crime because suburban white college activists incite looting slash rioting, provoking violence in our black communities as they and they as they run when police arrest our black youth. Yep. I mean, like what as a police officer, like, what are you going to do in this situation? You do your job. You get hate for it. You don't do your job. Everything, you know, goes to shit. <laughs> so. I just don't know. I, you know, the LA cops that I like acquainted with or whatever, they're like, morale is so low. We, we don't feel motivated to do anything because if we do the wrong thing, you know, that's our livelihoods on the line. If we do the right thing, nobody cares. And in fact, you know, we're going to get in trouble for just doing anything at, at, at any moment. So at this point, what do you do as a police officer? Hopefully you have just brave m men and women who just want to protect their communities because they see the problems. But yeah, you know. and a lot of times the decision's not even in the officer's hands to make because their hands are tied by policies or they do make the right decision. And then the DAs don't prosecute the crimes, let people write back out. So it's it's a really tough out there yeah. for officers right now. Did get another $50 super chat we see from Zach Meager. Maker. Thanks, Zach. Says, please never shy away from trans issues. I'm a trans man with a brain. For those <laughs> of us who are sane like Blair and Buck, need as many people speaking out as possible about the craziness. I appreciate your take so much. Fantastic job as always. Oh, wow. thank you. I'm always like, do I talk about this too much on this show? Because I, like, every time I see a new video, I'm like, oh, we got to talk about it. We got to talk about it. We'll, we'll, we'll throw that on there. We'll talk about it. But it's just like, are you guys overwhelmed by us talking about that issue? Some of you clearly not. I know Blair White's episode of Jubilee, Middle Ground, uh, where she's featured, is coming out next week, I think on the 5th, Jubilee said. So on Friday's show, we are going to be watching that and going to be reacting to it. So we're coming back to it next week. So I'm glad that, uh, you know, you guys appreciate us talking about that topic. And we're cool with Buck, too. He's been on the show in the past. Yes. We had him Love come Buck. on with another transgender woman that uh, was on a debate panel with Amala on one of the Jubilee videos and yeah. uh, they had them. I had Amala kind of moderate a debate. So if you haven't seen that, you go check it out. Uh, we got one more super chat here at the buzzer from mm -hmm. Flo Zur says the small Uruguayan town of 20,000 people I live in is having its first ever pride parade on Friday. It's spreading. Huh. Hopefully it's a tasteful one. Since it's your first, like are you going to come out of the gate? <laughs> I think there's uh, a did way. Did you see that video I sent you, Amala, that today on Twitter? Yes. Or yesterday of the San uh, Francisco one? We literally cannot show it on YouTube. It was cray cray. We cray cannot people show it. Peeing on each other and oh, doing gosh. unspeakable acts in public. On yeah. The of San Francisco. So, so hopefully, hopefully it's not that type of pride. Yeah, parade. hopefully yours is like a wholesome one. You think for the first one, they'd at least like calm it down a little bit and they're not going to come out like, yeah, a, you know, bowl in a China it. shop type thing. Uh, let uh, me know. A couple more. Couple oh, more, God. couple more from Dubious Twenty Twenty. It just gives twenty dollars no super or no message. Thank, Thank you for the super chat. 
and fresh start says woohoo second super chat second time i made the live also <laughs> just became a patron oh thank you oh love you gosh. guys and thanks for all you do thank you guys so much i greatly appreciate your support of the show and i'm glad that you're liking it you like the the subject matters that we're talking about if you ever want to suggest a subject you can do so by uh joining our discord server which i believe the link is in the description down below for that to is, for people yeah. to hop on we do have a show suggestions tab on that so and i i do look at your suggestions uh, and you know field them and some of the ones that you send do make it on this show maybe we need to build some sort of system where we shout out the person who gave us the topic suggestion but you can do that on discord if you're thinking like you know what i never see Alma talk about this topic or i just found this crazy video always send them my way because we do like to listen to your suggestions and we want to make this show into something that you greatly enjoy and you feel like is vocalizing you know your your values or at least starting a discussion guys Thank you so much for watching today. Let me know down below in the comments how you felt about the different stories we covered. Was Jonathan Van Ness genuinely crying? Was it a manipulation tactic? How do you feel about the looting in Philly? Is Disney going to shape up when it comes to injecting their own opinions on the culture war into their movies? And how does pretty privilege affect you're moving throughout the world. Is it more catcalling, more harassment? Does everybody deal with it? Should we mitigate this risk here? Let me know in the comments down below. We're going to be back tomorrow with a video, as I said, about gym girls and this idea of sexualizing yourself and then complaining when you are sexualized. Y'all know I'm passionate about it. Can't wait to talk about it. Can't wait for you to see it. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified when we're live. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. We did get another super chat from Dubious2020 that says, decriminalize everything until it's the Wild West, then everyone will welcome the police state. That could be, you know, end game here. If I really want to put on my conspiracy theory hat, that could be exactly what is happening. Uh -huh. I don't want that black pill yet, guys. So we're not going to get into that on today's show. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And 